We need to talk about xenophobia, the fear and hatred of foreigners. It's a fear that's so great, we're supposed to run away as fast as we can and do whatever's necessary to protect ourselves from those dangerous foreigners. It's like it's about us versus them. And it's more than just prejudice or bigotry. In the United States, it's been built into our laws, our politics, and even the very definition of who counts as an American. My family knows what it's like to be targeted as outsiders. This is a photograph of my grandparents' much-loved restaurant in Brooklyn, New York. It's where my mother and her sisters would go every afternoon to make egg rolls and to work the cashier. My grandfather was a huge fan of, can you guess it, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He named his restaurant The New Deal. The irony was that he was a Chinese immigrant and he couldn't vote for FDR or anyone else because U.S. laws prohibited Asian immigrants from becoming naturalized citizens. It's like America thought my family were dangerous outsiders who didn't belong and were unfit to become citizens. My family story echoes those of so many immigrants from across the United States. We know their experiences from their photographs, from their letters, from their poems, but also from the stories that they're sharing today. I'm a historian, and I know it's so important to connect these dots between past and present because they help us understand how we got here, what's changed, and what hasn't. So let's start with how we got here. The United States is known as a nation of immigrants, right? A country that has welcomed almost 80 million people over the past 200 years, people like my family and perhaps many of yours. But the United States is also a nation of xenophobia, meaning that we have feared and even hated almost every immigrant group that's come to the United States. U.S. government records show that we have actually removed over 57 million people since 1882. That's more than any other nation. So to say that our relationship with immigration is complicated, that's an understatement. This is because our immigration history reflects both America's promise, but also its failures. And let's be clear, it's also about race. From the very beginning of our country's history, white America defined Native Americans and African Americans as others, as outsiders, and has discriminated against them. The United States has waged war and cultural genocide upon Native Americans for centuries. It's been 400 years since the beginning of American slavery, but African Americans still remain unequal citizens targets of police brutality, discrimination, and mass incarceration. How we've treated Native Americans and African Americans has influenced how we've treated immigrants. This is because xenophobia is a form of American racism. It identifies certain immigrants as the good ones. You know who they are. They're the non-threatening kind with the fun accents who contribute to America. And then, of course, there's the bad ones. These are the ones who don't speak English, who don't assimilate, who are a threat to the country. We have welcomed and even recruited the good immigrants. We have banned and expelled the bad ones. It's been a matter of national origin and religion class, gender, sexuality, but especially race. This was true when our country was first founded, and it's true today. So let's take a short walk through history to see how this works. 
It's the 1700s, and Germans are suffering for months on crowded and filthy ships. They're headed to the colonies. They're looking for land and economic opportunity. But when they arrive, they're labeled swarms of swarthy aliens who herd together. Who said this? None other than one of our founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin. Samuel Morse, you may know him as the inventor of the telegraph. He actually wrote a book that called Catholic Immigration, a Foreign Conspiracy Against the United States. There was a minister in Boston named Theodore Parker. He called the Irish the most ignorant and barbarian race. These immigrants were considered to be such a threat that riots broke out in American cities. One of the deadliest happened in Louisville, Kentucky in 1855. This is when 500 citizens tore through the streets, attacking and killing foreigners. That day is still remembered as Bloody Monday. The Chinese were the next to come. They first came to try their luck as part of the California Gold Rush. Later, they were recruited to build the country's first transcontinental railroad. But when that work was done, lawmakers and labor leaders shouted that the Chinese must go. The threat was considered to be so great that in 1882, the United States passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. This is where we see the difference that race makes. The Chinese Exclusion Act was the first federal law to single out an entire group for exclusion based on their race and their class. Chinese were barred from becoming naturalized citizens. They were beaten, they were killed, they were driven out of cities and towns from across the U.S. West and they were deported. Chinese immigrants detained at the Angel Island Immigration Station in San Francisco wrote poems of frustration and despair on the prison walls. You can actually still read this one at the museum there. It reads, from now on, I'm departing far from this building. All of my fellow villagers are rejoicing with me. Don't say that everything within is Western styled. Even if it is built of jade, it has turned into a cage. The Exclusion Act was law of the land for 61 years. By the 1930s, all other Asians were also barred from the United States and from becoming naturalized citizens. Soon, immigrants from Southern, Eastern, and Central Europe were coming. They were also looking for economic opportunity or, like Jewish families in Russia, freedom from persecution. When asked why he was coming to America, one Jewish refugee said, in America lies hope. That hope may prove futile, he said, but here the fears are certainty. It was refugees and immigrants like him that helped to inspire Emma Lazarus's poem, the one that is inscribed at the base of the Statue of Liberty. You know the one. It starts, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. But a growing number of Americans believed that these immigrants and refugees were dangerous. A group calling itself the Immigration Restriction League called Italians the most ignorant race of Europe. National magazines published stories on the so-called Jewish invasion of America. And guess what? The Ku Klux Klan got involved. They were busy organizing campaigns of racial terror and white supremacy targeting African Americans, but they were also anti-immigrant and anti-Semitic. In the 1920s, they published this pamphlet calling for a vigilant protection of America for Americans against the flood of foreigners coming to the United States. So we can see how white supremacy, racism, and xenophobia work together in groups like the KKK, but we can also see it in our immigration policies. By the 1920s, the United States is leaving the doors open to immigrants from Northern and Western Europe, but we're restricting immigration from Southern, Central, and Eastern Europe, and we're shutting the door altogether to Asians. The U.S. Border Patrol gets established. Pretty soon it becomes a crime to enter the country without documentation. These laws last for decades. And by 1960, immigration is at a historic low in the United States. 
But in 1965, something fabulous happens. The Civil Rights Movement helps to usher in a new law, one that reopens the United States to new immigration. We have immigrants from Asia, Latin America, and Africa coming to our country again, transforming our nation. They're students, they're workers, they're doctors and family members. And they're also refugees fleeing another war. One refugee described their plight. I was born in Vietnam into a world at war. We lived and breathed war. We dreamt of peace. Eventually, over one million refugees from Southeast Asia were resettled in the United States. But at the same time, other policies are making it even more difficult for immigrants, especially those from Mexico, to enter the country. So a growing number come without documentation. An immigration backlash rises. We have politicians like Patrick Buchanan, who describe Mexican immigration as an illegal invasion of the United States. The U.S. begins its war on illegal immigration. The U.S.-Mexico border gets militarized, and growing numbers of Mexican and Latinx immigrants are arrested, detained, and deported. And then comes 9-11. Islamophobia, the fear and hatred of Muslims, rises. There are some Americans who blame all Muslims for the terrorist attacks. Some politicians deliberately feel Islamophobia as a way to get voters to the polls. The FBI reports that anti-Muslim hate crimes rises by 1,600 percent. Today, Xenophobia is as strong as it has ever been before. Current policies under the Trump administration include the Muslim ban, the wall along the U.S.-Mexico border, and a near end to our refugee resettlement program. During the current coronavirus pandemic, we're actually demonizing the very people who are keeping us safe, like public health care workers who become victims of anti-Asian hate crimes, or undocumented meat packers who lack safe working conditions just to get food on our tables. We're continuing a tradition that has deep roots. History shows that xenophobia has been part of our country since the very beginning. It's one of the ways in which race and racism works in America. And it's not going to go away anytime soon. But history also shows that xenophobia hurts us all. It is not just something that happens to immigrants. It feeds division, white supremacy, white nationalism. It furthers racial discrimination. The stakes could not be higher, and we must all take action. We must advocate for immigrants and refugees. We must challenge ineffective and cruel laws. And yes, we must vote xenophobic politicians out of office. But in order to fight hate, we must do more. So that's why I'm going to call on all of you to do something. Sometime today, tomorrow, this week, I want you to ask yourselves this question. What am I doing to challenge xenophobia and racism in my job, in my community, in my family? Let me share with you how I've answered this question. I'm lucky. I'm an educator. Many of my students are first-generation immigrants and refugees. I know that their stories are not yet part of the history books. I know that there's no archive that holds them and preserves them for future generations. I feel that it's my job to change that. I need to help them tell their stories because if they don't do it, who will? And if there's no archive to hold them, then we need to build it ourselves. So that's why I created the Immigrant Stories Digital Storytelling Project with my colleagues at the Immigration History Research Center. It helps anyone, anywhere, create, preserve, and share their stories for free. There are now over 350 stories in the collection. Some of them were created by my students, but most by strangers from across the country. 
Let me share two of them with you. The first is Tiago's. Tiago talks about what it was like to grow up in this country as an undocumented dreamer, the hardships he faced, the struggles he had, but also the joy that he felt when he finally became a legal permanent resident and got that driver's license. My time is now, he said. And then there's Liang. Liang describes how this super hip Sony stereo, she called it, was her family's most treasured possession while they were living in a refugee camp in Thailand. And how once in America, they used that stereo to send audio letters back to relatives left behind in Laos. It's been decades since her family came to the United States. And that Sony stereo is now sitting on a shelf collecting dust, but it is still one of her family's most treasured possessions. These stories and the hundreds of others like them have the power to change the way we think about immigration and challenge xenophobia and racism. They're the stories of real people, not stereotypes. They help us see what unites us rather than what divides us. We need more creative solutions like these that foster empathy, solidarity, and justice. So do the work needed to help create this change. We must all work together to build a future that is not about us versus them, but we.